Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here, and today I want to talk a little bit about an Elon Musk tweet from yesterday on Tesla potentially licensing its technology. And then we have a number of other fun topics to go through, like Tesla's 10Q quarterly filing, securitization of leases, as well as Tesla's credit rating. And then we'll also throw in a Morgan Stanley note. I promise it'll be more fun than it may sound. All right, we'll start off with the licensing topic. Yesterday, Elon Musk on Twitter replied to a tweet from Tesla Rati about an article which they titled, quote, Tesla obsessed German automakers look to solve multi-year tech deficit, end quote. Elon replied to that article saying, quote, Tesla is open to licensing software and supplying powertrains and batteries. We're just trying to accelerate sustainable energy, not crush competitors, end quote. So this has received a lot of attention and I think caught a lot of people maybe by surprise, but this is nothing new from Tesla. The same question was actually asked to Elon on their third quarter earnings call last year. And Elon replied, quote, yeah, I think there's, it would be consistent with the mission of Tesla to help other car companies with electric vehicles on the battery and powertrain front possibly on other fronts. So it's something we're open to. As a lot of people know, we open sourced our patents so that those would not serve as an obstacle to the adoption of electric vehicles or solar power or stationary storage. And we're definitely open to supplying batteries and powertrains and perhaps other things to other car companies." End quote. And of course, over time, Elon Musk has been very consistent with the supercharger network being available to other automakers, as long as they sort of came in with good faith and did their part in expanding the network and things like that. He's mentioned discussions about that in the past, but so far nothing has come to fruition. Though another EV startup, Bollinger Motors, did respond to Elon's tweet on this and ask if they could use the supercharger network, so maybe we would see something come of that. But getting back to the main point, this isn't really new, though Elon did here mention specifically software, which I don't think he has done in the past. And he also responded to a tweet asking about if that would include autopilot, to which he responded, sure. While all of this isn't necessarily new, I do still want to give my thoughts on it. As I've said before, I think it's unlikely, at least in the near term, that Tesla will do any sort of licensing on powertrain and batteries. If we think about that, Elon Musk just said on the last call that pretty much looking out in perpetuity, their biggest constraint is going to be some part of the battery supply chain. Stating that another way, that means that every single battery that Tesla can get their hands on, obviously within a certain threshold in terms of performance and cost, Tesla has plans in place to be able to utilize all of those batteries. They don't have access to mark up, share with another automaker that is then going to apply their own markup on that portion of the vehicle cost, and then put that into the market at a much higher price than Tesla could do themselves by removing that extra layer of markup. Direct quote here from Elon on the Q2 call. He says, quote, the real limitation on Tesla growth is sell production at an affordable price. That's the real limit, end quote. Later on in the call, he then says, quote, like the thing that bugs me the most about where we are right now is that our cars are not affordable enough. We need to fix that, end quote. So selling the resource that you are most constrained on to your competition, which is then going to sell it into the market, is completely incongruent with the goals of growth and increasing affordability. So that's my overall point of view, but that being said, there is always nuance to discussions like these, just like there is when we talk about Tesla's demand. Maybe in certain very specific circumstances, when Tesla is transitioning to new technology or something like that, there could be some limited excess capacity, in which case it might make sense to partner with another OEM to help fulfill that capacity. I just can't see it being anything significant, specifically on batteries. That's a big part of the powertrain, of course, but the other parts of the powertrain maybe could make sense to license. Tesla has obviously done a ton of work on efficiency throughout the powertrain, so maybe in some cases it could make sense for another automaker to want to purchase Tesla's electric motors, something like that. And if Tesla is constrained by batteries and not motors, in a situation like that, it could make sense for Tesla as well. I could also see that potentially being the case for Tesla's autopilot hardware and software. They're not going to be able to just license the software, of course. They work in tandem. At a bare minimum, the other OEMs would need Tesla's full self-driving computer. And in terms of sensor input, I'm not sure how flexible Tesla's architecture is going to be for variety of sensor input or location of sensor input, things like that. I would guess they could emulate a lot of that stuff without having to technically license it from Tesla, as long as the data being collected by whatever sensor suite was similar or maybe even needing to be identical to Tesla's. So I could see that happening. It would be a pretty big undertaking for another OEM to do that and to sort of partner with Tesla in such an intimate way. And the licensing agreement would have to be pretty robust because it would obviously have to cover the future use case of a robo taxi. So I could see something like that technically developing, but I think there are just so many conditionals there that it would be tough to make something like that come to fruition. Tesla's other software may be a bit easier to license, but a lot of that stuff Tesla is already licensing itself. You know, things like Netflix, Spotify, various games. It's sort of the combination of the whole package coming together and the user interface where Tesla is adding the value, something that I'm not sure you can just really replicate by licensing from Tesla. 
I mean, a lot of that software and a lot of that user interface is developed congruently with the hardware of the vehicle. For example, on the Model Y, the new feature, which will turn off the passenger air vent if there's no weight detected in that seat. In general, it all just feels kind of like a long shot. I think the supercharger network is the most partnerable and simultaneously is the most beneficial to other OEMs. So I think if we do see something, I would expect a supercharger network partnership to come first, but that offer has been on the table for years now and we still have not seen anything develop. That situation does of course evolve over time though as Tesla continues to grow and take market share and other OEMs continue to struggle with gaining traction on their electric vehicles. So back to the tweet, I do think Tesla has good intentions. They would love to help other automakers transition to electric vehicles. Of course, that was really the original roadmap, demonstrate the viability of electric vehicles so others would come on board, but it just hasn't happened. Just because it hasn't happened though, Tesla isn't going to change their stance and all of a sudden say, nope, now we're just trying to kill everybody. Even if in reality, that is sort of what plays out and ends up being the quickest path to transitioning to sustainable transportation. That is what every decision will come back to. What is going to most quickly accelerate the transition? That is the framework for decisions. That's how we should always consider it as investors. Personally, I don't see how giving up Tesla's batteries does anything to advance that, but maybe in some other areas, there are opportunities for partnership if other automakers have the humility and the means to make something like that happen. Or not just other automakers, it doesn't have to be a traditional OEM. Maybe Tesla could partner with a new upstart or maybe one of the tech companies interested in moving into the space. One other quick thought on this tweet and then we will move on. I don't think this tweet or the stance in general is done without consideration to the impact on public relations. I think the perception that Tesla is open to helping competitors is an important one. At the surface level, it certainly seems as though it goes with Tesla's mission, though as we talked about, the nuanced detail may end up with a different path. And then I think over time, it is important for Tesla to consistently leave these breadcrumbs, showing that they are not intentionally creating an anti-competitive market. And perhaps the timing is not coincidental, given the fact that right now there are antitrust hearings going on for Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google. It's not inconceivable that Tesla would end up in a similar situation someday, having to defend themselves, especially because of Tesla's level of vertical integration and considering the closed off nature right now, at least of the supercharger network something like that ever were to come up, Tesla can point to the opening up of patents and their consistent message over time that they were willing to partner with other competitors. All right, let's move on from that topic at least a little bit here. I want to transition into the Morgan Stanley updated price target and note, which ties in a bit here because they do have powertrain sales as part of their model for Tesla. So as we know, Morgan Stanley does three price targets. They have a bear case, a base case, and a bull case. Morgan Stanley has increased their base case price target from $740 per share to $1,050 per share, and increased their bull case from $2,070 up to $2,500. They opened the note by saying, quote, our revised $1,050 price target is based on 3 million units by 2030, with 2x industry margins and average selling prices. We would need much more than this, volume and autonomous vehicle revenue, while ignoring a host of near-term risks to upgrade the stock. Remain underweight, end quote. So that 3 million target is up from their previous target of 2.3 million before, and I'm sure at this point, I probably can stop saying how far off that is from Tesla's ambitions of 20 plus million vehicles for 2030. I mean, right now, Tesla's capacity is 700,000, soon to grow to 800,000, which is before full capacity for Giga Shanghai and before any capacity for Giga Berlin and Giga Texas. We have seen rumors that Tesla plans to eventually build up to 2 million vehicles per year from Giga Berlin alone. And while those are just rumors, even if we assume just 500,000 vehicle capacity from Berlin and Texas, that would mean that basically over two to three years, Tesla has added capacity for one and a half million vehicles. So Morgan Stanley would only be projecting them to add about a million more in capacity over the following, let's call it seven years or so. So yeah, pretty pessimistic. They forecast by 2030 about 1 million Model Y vehicles. So they're actually relatively bullish on that, but only 100,000 Cybertrucks by 2025 and 200,000 by 2030. And then for their bull case, they're forecasting a total vehicle delivery number of 6 million, so twice their base case, which basically brings their price target up to the $2,000 level. And then they add in $175 of price target from the powertrain sales that we mentioned, which under that bull case, they forecast at 2 million per year at $15,000 a piece. The rest of the bull case is then $350 from Tesla Network and $40 per share from Tesla Energy and Solar. All right, next up today, I want to talk a little bit about Tesla's 10Q quarterly filing, which was published yesterday. These are pretty dense filings, so I'm still working through it, but I do want to point out a couple items that caught my attention initially. And the first is on regulatory credits. So in Q2, remember, they came in at 428 million, which was a new all-time high and up from Q1's 354 million. 
and about 40% higher than my low confidence forecast of $300 million for the quarter. You may recall, though, in the earnings preview episode, when discussing regulatory credits, I mentioned that Tesla has had $140 million of regulatory credit revenue that has been sitting on their books as deferred revenue now for the last few quarters, so I noted the possibility of that being recognized this quarter as a wild card. Well, with the 10Q filed, we can now see that Tesla did actually recognize that $140 million, which helps explain a couple things. The first, why the regulatory credit sales this quarter were so high, and the second is why the forecast for the second half of the year for regulatory credits, while Zach said was hard to forecast, was a bit lower than what it was for the first half. Remember, he said for the year, regulatory credit should roughly double from 2019's level, implying just a bit over $200 million per quarter in the second half of the year versus Q1 and Q2, averaging $364 million per quarter. If we subtract that $140 million out of Q2, then the average turns to about $295 per quarter, much closer to the forecast for the second half of the year, while also giving Tesla some cushion on that regulatory credit guidance, which as I said, I do expect them to at least slightly overachieve. If we take that $140 million of deferred regulatory credit revenue out of the Q2 number, that means regulatory credit sales were $288 million, down 19% from Q1, probably more in line with what we would have expected based on other automakers' sales, particularly in Europe and particularly from Fiat Chrysler, though we'll probably get a little bit more information on that on Friday when Fiat Chrysler reports their second quarter results. The other interesting note on this in the 10Q is, as Zach said on the earnings call, A lot of their regulatory credit revenue has not actually been received yet as cash, so it's sitting in accounts receivable, which does not yet count on Tesla's cash balance. As I said, that was probably one of the reasons my free cash flow forecast for the quarter was off so significantly. So in the 10Q, we learned that, quote, as of June 30th, 2020, one entity represented 10% or more of our total accounts receivable balance, which was related to sales of regulatory credits, end quote. So that point was different than it was at year-end 2019, in which Tesla said no entity represented 10% or more. So that means that one account receivable for Tesla is growing, and that is from regulatory credits. That's likely Fiat Chrysler. Unless Fiat Chrysler defaults, that cash will come in at some point. And because Tesla's total accounts receivable are about $1.4 billion, that means this is at least $140 million, likely more, in cash that Tesla is waiting on. So when that comes in, it'll be added to the cash balance, but... Because this has already occurred, it may just be a normal delay in payment, which would mean that as long as this account is owing Tesla money for these regulatory credits, as long as that transaction is occurring, there may always just be that little buffer of a couple hundred million dollars until it finally winds down and Tesla gets that last bit. If we think about how that looks on the accounting, essentially the first quarter that this transaction series starts taking place, there will be a hit as accounts receivable increases, but your cash balance doesn't for that money that you've earned then the quarters in between are basically net neutral in terms of those two positions relatively. And then when that series of transactions ends, the next quarter you would then finally collect all that cash. And then at that point in time, your cash position would finally be caught up to accurately reflect the total value of that deal. All right, anyway, probably too deep on that topic, but the other interesting thing I wanted to point out from the 10Q is China sales for the quarter. Tesla breaks out revenue by region, and in Q2, China generated $1.4 billion in revenue, That was up from $690 million last year, meaning Tesla more than doubled the revenue in China during Q2. Obviously, this is the result of Gigafactory Shanghai, but especially a significant jump in Q2 when we compare to Q1. Revenue in Q1 was $900 million, up from $780 million from Q1 2019. So Q1 was up 16% in China year over year, but Q2 up 103%. That $1.4 billion was 23% of Tesla's total $6 billion in revenue. And if we were to annualize that quarterly number, it would come out to about $5.5 billion per year, which, fun fact, is more than the entire company of Tesla generated in 2015. I always enjoy looking back on those statistics. Annual revenue in 2015 for Tesla was $4 billion, and then $7 billion in 2016. All right, next up today, I want to go through some additional capital that Tesla has just raised earlier this week, or intends to raise, through the offering of a $780 million asset-backed security. The asset backing that security is about 16,000 Tesla leases, about half Model 3, half Model S, and X combined, generally maturing in late 2022 or early 2023. What an asset backed security is, is essentially Tesla selling off the cash flow from these leases in exchange for capital up front, and then the cash flow from those leases is used to, over time, make the payments for interest and principal on that security. So they're basically trading the cash flows for a lump sum upfront payment, which they can then use the cash for right away upon completion of the offering. So this is nothing new for Tesla, pretty standard operating procedure for the company. 
They offered similar asset-backed securities two times in 2018 and once in 2019 for, I believe, a combined total of about $2.5 billion. So I do think this makes a secondary offering of shares a bit less likely, though if Tesla decides to accelerate some of their plans anywhere, it's definitely still on the table. But this should push Tesla's cash balance above $9 billion, though of course it does add debt as well. All right, next is some news from the S&P, though not the news that everybody is waiting for about potential S&P 500 inclusion, but the S&P Global Ratings Organization has increased their credit rating on Tesla from a B- to a B+. The same rating change also applies to Tesla's unsecured debt. About the change, S&P says, quote, despite the closure of its main factory in Fremont, California for nearly half of the second quarter, Tesla Inc. continued to improve profitability and cash flow generation. Moreover, we think the company's competitive position continues to strengthen with improved cost absorption on larger volumes, higher operational efficiency, and process automation, end quote. The note is relatively lengthy, so I won't go through all of it. They highlight upsides to the rating and downsides, but in terms of the downsides, they say, quote, governance risks will remain a bigger negative for credit quality than environmental and social risks, given the risk that CEO Elon Musk violates securities laws on fair disclosure and the recent high rate of senior executive turnover, end quote. I'll pause there because I feel like that last part needs a citation. From my perspective, it seems like the senior team has been relatively stable, except for the departure of JB, and even for him, technically still an advisor at the company. Anyway, continuing on, they say, quote, we view the effectiveness of the committee that oversees Mr. Musk's communications as poor, given the rising risks from current and future litigation, as demonstrated by the 2018 subpoenas from the U.S. Securities Exchange Commission and related investigations from the U.S. Department of Justice. We view key man risk as very high for Tesla, given Mr. Musk's dominant role in the company. In late 2018, the settlement with the SEC, under which Mr. Musk resigned as chairman of the board of directors but remained CEO, averted a significant disruption to Tesla's operations, end quote. I definitely think it's fair to perceive key man risk as being high for Tesla, but from my perspective, I would view it for different reasons than those that are laid out here, but it is understandable. Elon, of course, is extremely important to the company, but it is still nice to see the other team members like Drew and Jerome and Zach get more time on the earnings calls. Hopefully, as that continues, that key man risk becomes a little bit less. All right, last quick thing for today. We just have another news on a Tesla Energy groundbreaking project. This was reported on today by MarketWatch and is about a project that we have discussed in the past, the Moss Landing project with PG&E and Tesla. So just an update that last week construction did begin on this project, which will be for about 730 megawatt hours of energy storage, though could eventually be optioned up to 1.1 gigawatt hours. All right, I think that will finally wrap it up for today. As always, huge thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe, sign up for notifications. Make sure you're following me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast. And I'll see you tomorrow for the Thursday, July 30th episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.